So today we're going to be covering a subject I had been meaning to for a while, but due to my unwillingness to continue subjecting myself to an academic paper that could be equated to writing Tumblr on toilet paper, it has been delayed to now. Yeah. So we're going to be looking at an article and a referenced academic paper. The subject is about intersectionality and quantum physics. Problematic, I know. But we're going to be looking at it nonetheless because some of the talking points within the article and within the paper itself are rather interesting. And I see no reason to not share the cancer. Feminist researcher supports combining intersectionality and quantum physics. Binary and absolute differences relate to exploitative structures. A feminist academic from the Netherlands has written an article melding the worlds of quantum physics and intersectionality in a journal published by Duke University Press. Before we continue making a little more headway with this article, and then dive into the related paper, I want to point out that the only way I was able to get a hold of that paper, because it was behind a paywall, was courtesy of a very kind patron who is luckily still a student in the United States, so had access to, well, where it is that they hide these delightful papers. Whitney Stark argues in support of combining intersectionality and quantum physics to create different perspectives on organizing practices conducted by marginalized people and to enable safer spaces in the latest issue of the Minnesota Review. The idea of only having someone in charge because they're a marginalized person is, if anything, devaluing what that person brings to the table and reducing them to the color of their skin or their sexuality or their religious identity because apparently that's also something to be marginalized about. Stark identifies classical Newtonian physics as one of the guiding sciences at the height of Western imperialism, which identifies separate beings and absolute differences between particles, waves, space, and time. The part where I said which identifies separated beings and absolute differences between particles and waves, space, and time is the clear indicator as to where this and intersectionality are going, i.e. trying to use science to reason or rationalize how intersectionality can be applied in sciences so that marginalized people are given preferred place over those that are the more dominant feature, whether it be someone who is white or whether it be someone who is, I don't know, male. The structural thinking of individualized separatism with binary and absolute differences as the basis for how the universe works is embedded in many structures of classification, according to Stark. Stark goes on to argue that the arbitrary exceptionalism or fetishizing understanding of human bodies as segmented integrities is part of the apparatus that enables oppression. This is biopolitical. I, being white, should not be in all spaces. So now I think it would be a good opportunity to have a look at the pages referenced in the article so far. Context is important after all, so I'm going to read as much of it as I can without putting myself or you to sleep. So what do we do if we are not subjects? One of the main political imperatives of post-human and quantum feminist theoretical projects, while seemingly and probably humanist or a deconstruction, in that they focus often on talking between humans using human understood materials, is dismantling contemporary assumed unified subjectivities, citing them as westernized Cartesian projects reeking of oppressive models like racism, sexism, ableism, cissexism, speciesism, to distinguish stabilize the priority of human. This strategy has been specifically set in opposition to identity politics, a strategy integrally important to many anti-oppression activisms in much of its own writing, a severe domestication and critiqued by anti-racist perspectives for attempting to desubjectify while some specifically black people are fighting for subjectivity. The binary set up in discounting identity politics and the assumption that critique like this is oppositional more than it is care work are again dangerous tricks of disconnection. Perhaps they are exactly what matters. A Cartesian, independent human subject approach proliferated through the spread of Western sciences in the height of Western imperialism, implemented in justification of multifaceted hierarchy, creation and exploitation, non-human animals, nature, non-life, is a particularized hierarchizing of connectivity in which quantum and physical connectivities 
are denied or denigrated as not mattering. One of the most important and guiding sciences of that time was classical Newtonian physics, which identifies separate beings and absolute differences between particles and waves, space and time. This structural thinking of individualized separatism with binary and absolute differences as the basis for how the universe works seeped into, poured over, is embedded in many structures of classification, which understand similarity and difference in the world imposed in many hierarchical and exploitative organizational structures, whether through gender, life, non-life, natural borders, and so on, not only working quite well with this capitalist idea of liberal independence, also deeming any especially unseeable connections or intradependencies, that is, not real or important, or not even physically there. The arbitrary exceptionalism or fetishizing understanding of human bodies as segmented integrities based on Cartesian, Lacanian, visuality and the division of physical, which can then be set in hierarchical objectification, is part of the apparatus that enables oppression. This is biopolitical. I hope to all that have listened to that understand just how truly, and this word gets used a lot, but it is fairly true. I hope you understand just how cancerous that is. But the idea of integrating two ideas is one that intrigues me. Can you take ideas from quantum physics and apply them to intersectionality? It's one that interests me nonetheless, and if you've been listening to me so far, I would definitely love to know what you think in the comments below. Stock also argues that the tendency to categorize people has historically hurt activism efforts by smaller minority groups, since their efforts are often subsumed or overshadowed by dominant identity groups. And to most, the simplest way of dealing with this would be to means assess the individual rather than join or create a group. Have your problems, your issues, dealt with individually rather than as a group because then of course not all your interests are truly being met. This somehow reminds me of why politics is getting more and more complex as no one really shares all their ideas with any political party anymore. But people will still vote for a party that has the most ideas that they align with. The problems that arise when small minority groups are overshadowed by large identity groups can be seen clearly when considering black feminist history. For instance, in many official feminist histories of the United States, black African American women organizing and writings are completely unaccounted for before the 1973 creation of the middle class. Professional National Black Feminist Organization, Stark writes, This happened because of the frequent subsuming of intersectional identities under the supposedly encompassing meta-identities, namely the tendency for black feminist resistance efforts to be subsumed under the broader category of feminism. Those quotes were taken from a segment on the paper called The Multiplicities of Uninclusivity. I'm going to yet again read some of it to you until you or I get bored. How does this matter to serious attempts to think activist practices differently? With a quantum feminist bodily phenomenological subject political gatherings, we can extend our logic of subjecthood to other political gatherings, like a non-governmental organization, NGO. These subjects, entities, or what have you, are often acknowledged, like other bodies, based on their continued legibility as a subject. For instance, in many official feminist histories of the United States, black African American women's organizing and writings are completely unaccounted for before 1973 creation of the middle class, professional national black feminist organization. Part of this absence is the frequent subsuming of the intersectional identities under the supposedly encompassing meta-identities more readily recognized by as hegemonicized groupings. For instance, black women subsumed under black, equated with male or feminist, equated with white woman. Part is because much of this organizing was done not with a goal of entity longevity, but for a temporary goal, like forming a daycare. Part is because all this was happening in the same time space as it was denied by large white publishing houses. These are not coincidences. In the realm of contemporary hegemonic legitimizations, intersectional multiple identities, these temporary overlapping alliances are not allowed as legitimate. In other words, their interference patterns are posited as neither agenteel nor in constellation. But as Bell Hooks points out, just because these movements were, are, cannot be recognized as such does not negate their feminist agency. 
that is, not all feminist struggles can be understood within the framework of organised movements. And perhaps more importantly, much of feminist organising, specifically feminist of colour organising, has political goals explicitly to occupy standpoints of intersubjectivity and challenge to the singular subject of traditional philosophy and liberal feminism requiring organising and coalition beyond singular dimension. Many of these goals are matted, enacted, organised with practices that in their structure are illegible to prioritised consistency of time. For example, intentionally not having a permanent centre of organising, because by constantly shifting the centre to communities that face intersecting forms of oppression, we gain a more comprehensive view of the strategies needed to end all forms of violence. Would you look at that? Science has been used to legitimise intersectionality. Oh, and it's very nice to now know where the whole idea for shifting the goalposts comes from. It's enlightening. Stark also argues that by deprioritising privileged people, safer spaces could be created. She gives the example of deprioritising herself. If any reason is going to be given as to why you should give up a safe space, it shouldn't be because of the colour of your skin. For you in particular, it should be because of how much of an idiot you are. So let's quantify it by saying stupidity levels. For instance, I being white should not be in all spaces, positions of authority or meetings. She said because her presence could stall movements towards progress. That, for the sake of context, is entirely dependent on what position it is you're involved in. To be honest, this is up there in levels of stupidity, earlier mentioned stupidity, with people saying a white person cannot be involved in a diversity-related position of authority because white. Snark concludes a paper by hoping that the apparatuses of oppression change. Rather than read what is written on that article, I'm instead going to read the final passage from the paper itself under the title Offerings. What post-humanist quantum feminisms have to offer in this materialist understanding, this mattered and mattering understanding of connectivity, of the material flux of borders, is the intrinsic accountability in such epistemology, in intrinsic value, all mattered and mattering, spatial, interacting, shifting bondings and bodies, exchanging. Thus, when an apparatus shifts, the spatialization of processes, the spaces that things take up, what is considered a body shifts. This is directly political. This can allow for experimental shifts to work toward more accountable, always shifting ways of operating in efforts toward less oppressive spatializations, power stratifications, practices. Hopefully this alliance can enact ways of valuing differently, coalitional, politics as not just unifying human identity currently, coalitional politics as not just unifying human identity gatherings, but connecting particles, ideas, rocks, spaces, electrons, not holistically, but as allowing for constant shift, care, respect, and non-linearity, accountable for marking marks on phenomenological bodies. These quantum interrelations have different political diffractions in non-hierarchical structures of intersectional anti-oppression activisms, in how they acknowledge multiplicity and connection they always have. Perhaps with the additional alliances of these thought structures and terminologies, apparatuses can shift towards differing energy gatherings that help to enable space for difference from, for, by, difference. It's papers like this that make me want to drink a lot more. It's papers like this that question why I even went to university to begin with. It is papers like this that question why I spent so much money on a degree when I could have just blagged it like this. I'm going to go and get a drink now. Thank you all for listening.